So if you stimulate the neuron by injecting some kind of a current pulse into the cell, and you record the electrical potential at the, at the axon, at this point here, for example, every time you stimulate, no matter how strong the stimulus is, you get a response that's more or less the same. Okay? It's traveling along the axon. So this is referred to as the action potential. It's not a graded potential. It's not proportional to the size of the stimulus, but it's relatively constant, relatively consistent. Okay? So the action potential is pretty much the same size each time the cell is stimulated, no matter how strongly the cell is stimulated. So these are graded responses, graded potentials. These are not graded. These are sort of consistently the same size. As we'll see later, you can change the size of the max potential, but for the purpose for the purpose of the functioning of the nervous system, the cell body is integrating inputs in a uh, in a manner that's proportional. The response of the, of the cell is proportional to the strength of the input. Okay, whereas the information that's then converted into action potentials here at the axon hilla is set in the form of digital pulses that are more or less the same, all right? This is what goes to the brain, action potentials, for the most part. So everything that happens in the brain is conducted along axons to the next synapse in the form of these digital pulses. This is sort of like a digitizer. Whether the stimulus is weak or strong, as long as it's above, above the critical level to generate an action potential, all the action potentials are pretty much the same. Okay? So the brain, the currency that the brain uses to, in, in synaptic circuits that give rise to behaviors and cognition is action potentials. And the currency is largely based on the frequency of action potentials per unit time. So as we'll see in the sensory system if you have a higher number of action potentials per, per, uh, per given time, that means it's a strong stimulus. If you have a, a small number of action potentials over a given time period, that's due to a weak stimulus. The same thing is true in the uh, motor system. A motor neuron, if it fires at a high frequency, it's going to cause a greater contraction of the muscle fibers that the motor neuron is connected to. If it's firing at a low frequency, it gives rise to a weaker contraction. That's called rate coding. We'll come back and talk about that later. Okay. So these are graded potentials. These are action potentials. And it's the action potentials that are involved in nerve-to-nerve -nerve communication. We'll talk about those next week. Oops, that was the wrong one. Okay. okay, so at the far end of the axon is the presynaptic nerve terminal. So here's an axon. It may branch, but we'll only consider one branch of the axon. This is the presynaptic nerve terminal. Here's the axon. Here's the action potential that's whizzing down the, the axon and arriving at the presynaptic nerve terminal down here. There, there are basically two types of synaptic connections between nerve cells. One is electrical, one is chemical. This is the electrical one here, this is the chemical one. I'll talk briefly about the electrical synapse. Electrical synapses, to my knowledge, are relatively rare, whereas in the nervous system, something like 99% of all synaptic connections, or maybe more than that, are chemical synapses, whereas electrical synapses are relatively few and far between. But they do exist. So what's interesting about the electrical synapse is that the presynaptic nerve cell, nerve cell, is very closely opposed to the postsynaptic cell. This is probably a dendrite of postsynaptic cell or a, uh, a dendritic spine where these synapses are formed, right? So here's the presynaptic neuron, presynaptic nerve terminal, here's the postsynaptic uh, dendrite. And you can see that the two membranes are very close to each other. In fact, they're so close that each membrane expresses an ion channel called a connexon, which is aligned with an ion channel in the postsynaptic Here's that ion channel in the presynaptic membrane, which is um, closely opposed to the same ion channel, the same connexon in the postsynaptic. 
So basically, we brought these two membranes very close together, and we have these connexons that are right up next to each other, which then form a pathway from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell. And they, they, this can be a relatively large pore between the two cells, so that our electrical current can flow unimpeded, unimpeded from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic cell. So that's electrical transmission, it's very fast, okay? Some of these ion channels are so big that they also actually allow chemicals to diffuse either from the pre to the post or from the post to the pre And they can also float, they can be regulated to a certain extent. If this is looking, looking down on one of these connexons or these gap junctions, here the junction is open, so there's a pathway from the pre to the post cell, here it's closed. Six uh, segments that, that uh, form together to form each one of these connexons that are opposed to each other. All right? So, the thing about electrical synapses is that they allow very rapid transmission of electrical signals from one cell to the next because the, uh, the current, the X potential, forms current that can flow from one cell to the other and continues along the postsynaptic cell. In contrast, we have these chemical synapses. So in the case of the chemical synapse, the presynaptic neuron is relatively closely opposed to the, the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. But instead of being really close to each other, there's a bit of a gap. And this gap is called the synaptic cleft. Okay? Here it's a very small gap. These are called gap junctions. Here there's a synaptic cleft that basically separates the presynaptic nerve terminal from the postsynaptic uh, membrane. All right? And so during chemical synaptic transmission, the X potential comes down the axon, arrives at the presynaptic nerve terminal, but instead of having the current flowing from one cell to the next, it stops here. But this X potential depolarizes the presynaptic nerve terminal. And it depolarizes it sufficiently that it can open up voltage-sensitive ion channels, which I'll talk about next week. These voltage-sensitive ion channels allow calcium to flow into the cell, Calcium interacts with these synaptic vesicles that contain neurotransmitter. Some of the synaptic vesicles fuse with the presynaptic terminal membrane to uh, form a fusion pore, which allows the, the contents, the synaptic neurotransmitter that's inside these vesicles, to actually leave the synaptic vesicle and the molecules of neurotransmitter swim across, swim across the synaptic cleft. Actually, they move by random grounding motion where they can interact with the postsynaptic receptors uh, that are expressed in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. Okay? So the neurotransmitter binds with the postsynaptic receptor, and that can either open up ion channels to allow positive charge into the cell to excite the postsynaptic cell, or they can um, uh, open up specific ion channels that allow chloride to flow into the cell to hyperpolarize. So this is called a chemical synapse. And I'll talk a lot about synaptic transmission probably the week after this. But this is just to give you sort of an overview of how the nervous system works. There are relatively few electrical synapses that allow very rapid cell-to-cell -cell communication. But most, most uh, neurons use uh, chemical synapses, which uh, are a little bit slower because you need time to release the neurotransmitter, there's time for it to swim, time to bind the postsynaptic receptor, the receptor has to open an ion channel and then either depolarize or hyperpolarize the postsynaptic cell. That all takes a certain amount of time. So this is much slower means of uh, synaptic transmission. But the nice thing about this is that you can regulate the amount of neurotransmitter that's released. And so you can change the strength of the synaptic connection. And I'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Question. They've been studied in, in the chick ciliary ganglion, that's a sensory, sensory ganglion. Um, I'm pretty sure they, they exist. I think they exist. There's more of them in, in infants, and they tend to disappear as people mature. Do you uh, Fred, does any of you guys know where electrical synapses are in the human? As I said, they're rare. 
but they, they have been studied and they, they are good in certain, usually sub, submillion species to use these more for fast, for fast electrical transmission. Okay, so that's, that's chemical symmetric transmission. We'll talk about that much more later when we talk about how synapses can be altered in their strength, leading to things like memory formation. Okay. And then finally, there are a variety of different types of synaptic configurations. The one that I've talked about so far is from the axon's presynaptic nerve terminal onto the dendrite of the postsynaptic cell. This is called the axodendritic synapse. But some presynaptic neurons also make synaptic contact onto the cell body of a postsynaptic neuron. Cell body is an old term for cell body is the soma. And so this would be an axosomatic synapse. There's also um, uh, axo-axonal synapses whereby the presynaptic neuron makes a synaptic contact with the presynaptic nerve terminal on the postsynaptic neuron. So the presynaptic neuron there, thereby can control the level of uh, membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell, which can regulate the amount of neurotransmitter that's released in the postsynaptic cell. So there's presynaptic inhibition and presynaptic facilitation to so increase or decrease the amount of neurotransmitter that's released in the postsynaptic cell. Also, there are dendrodendritic synapses as well. All right. Yes. In the retina. Electrical synapses are in the retina. Which types of cells? Uh, bipolar cells. Bipolar cells. Oh, that's we'll talk about the retinal ganglion cells in uh, great detail in a, maybe halfway through the course. So some of those have electrical synapses. I didn't know that. That's interesting. All right. Now I want to talk in a little bit more detail about the neuron in general and how, how it comes to be that the neuron has a membrane potential, an electrical a voltage difference between the inside of the cell and the extracellular fluid that it's bathed in. That's minus, somewhere between minus 60 and minus 80 million. Why did that happen? In order to explain that, I'll go through a lot of slides. Each, all the slides are the same. It's just um, one thing changes from one, one slide to the next. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Channels. I'll talk about patch planting and uh, IV curves, voltage, current voltage curves. IV curves and equilibrium potential in the equation. If we have enough time, otherwise I'll talk about that on Monday. Oh yeah, I have this And these are the learning, learning objectives. You can read about them at your leisure. They're on the website. Popular design channels, IV curves, chemical and molecular forces, the dry ions, equilibrium potential, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so this is a very nice picture of a cell membrane. This is a. Uh, These are phospholipids. Okay, so it's a lipid bilayer. And generally, things can't diffuse very well through this lipid bilayer. Okay. Probably, uh, this, this shows uh, various, various chemicals and their permeability, which is measured in terms of centimeters per second of diffusion of that solute, of that chemical, through the membrane. And you can see the water sort of diffuses through the membrane better than most of these other chemicals, such as, such as the ions that make up the extracellular fluid. So the chloride, potassium, and so So water is the best. Solids can be transported through the membrane passively, for example, diffusion. The movement for diffusion, the movement is based on concentration gradient, tends to uh, chemicals tend to flow from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration by diffusion. 
I'll talk about that in just a minute. There's also a facilitated diffusion in which chemicals can flow through an ion channel, which I'll talk about ad nauseum next. And this is facilitated because sometimes the ion channel can be closed, preventing the facilitated diffusion of the chemical. But when it's open, the chemicals have a pathway to go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Okay? There's also filtration and osmosis as well. And there's also active transport where you can have a, a um, basically an ion channel that requires energy to take a, an ion or a chemical and bring it from the inside to the outside. From the outside to the inside of the cell or from the inside to the outside of the cell. But that requires energy, so that's active transport. Active meaning it requires ATP, okay? So what is an ion channel? I've mentioned this many times. Ion channels are basically protein structures that are embedded in the lipid bilayer. And um, these, these proteins are very interesting because they have a lipophilic or a hydrophobic portion that likes to stay inside the lipid bilayer. You feel very happy there. And then there's ex uh, external and internal components that are less lipophilic, more hydrophilic. Okay, they like water rather than fat. And ion channels typically have a pore from the inside, from the outside to the inside of the cell that allows ions to flow through. So the pore spans the entire membrane from the outside to the inside. When the pore is open, that means that the ions that fit through this channel can flow from the outside to the inside of the cell, or conversely, from the inside to the outside, right? But the ion channels have gates, so that the ion channels can be closed sometimes, and that prevents the facilitated diffusion of the ion from the outside to the inside and vice versa. Okay. And in addition to having a gate which can close the channel to prevent flow, many ion channels also have a selectivity filter, which is basically uh, part of the membrane that only allows ions or ions that are um, in hydration of a certain size to pass through the membrane. Larger ions are not allowed to flow through. I think that's better. I thought I had another slide that talks about this more specifically. I guess I don't. Okay, so that's the ion channel. I'll come back and talk about ion channels again when we talk about uh, molten sensitive ion channels and chemically sensitive ion channels. But right now, just remember that the ion channels provide the pathway for ions to flow into and out of the cell through the membrane because ions are typically not very, the membrane is not very permeable for the um, passive diffusion of ions through the lipid bilayer. Okay? Okay. So I want to get quickly to the patch cut. Patch cut is a very sophisticated technique. It's used a lot these days to study the biophysics of nerve cell membranes. And what, it, what patch cut allows you to do is to measure current flowing through individual ion channels. A very clever technique. It can also be used to measure the entire macroscopic current flowing into the, into or out of an entire neuron using whole cell patch clamp recording. But I'll talk about single ion channel recordings right now. So this method was developed by uh, Mayer and Suckman, two German scientists who got the Nobel Prize in 1991 for developing this technology. And what it allows you to do is to measure electrical currents across a very small area or a patch of the neuron's membrane that incorporates one or just a few ion channels, okay? And so the way that it works is you have a, a microelectrode, usually it's a glass micropipette with a very, a very small tip, one to two microns in diameter. Then you can push it up against the cell. Here's a nerve cell and expressing ion channels that are indicated by blue. If you stick the electrode onto the cell, and you apply a little bit of suction, negative pressure, to sort of pull this portion of the membrane closer into the pipette. A little bit of magic, hitting the table. Just people have all kinds of methods to do this. If you're lucky, 
you can actually rip off a portion of the membrane of the cell, and if you're really lucky, that portion of the membrane or that patch of membrane will contain an ion channel. And so by using this technique, you can actually measure current that flows through the ion channel from the, from the extracellular medium to the uh, from the extracellular medium to the inside of the cell in this direction, or vice versa. Okay? So you have your um, membrane patch with the ion channel and the salt solution. And you have a solution on the other side of the membrane in the pipette. And you can use this method to record current flowing through the ion channel uh, in either direction. Okay? So when you, when you uh, successfully obtain a patch of membrane with an ion channel, and you start to record the currents that are flowing through the ion channel, you can see that sometimes there's no, no current at all, so this is the baseline. Then occasionally there's an um, inward current that's measured like a stuck change in, uh, in current like this that lasts for a specific amount of time, and then the ion channel closes it. So these represent ionic currents, the flow of ions through the ion channel, as measured using this patch plant technology. So you can see that the ion channel opens briefly to allow ions to flow through, so there's a current. Closes again, then opens again, closes again. So that the state of the ion channel fluctuates between closed and open. Okay? Now, this, this shows another example of uh, patch clamp recordings from uh, a patch of membrane that contains an ion channel. So what's important to remember when we talk about these types of patch clamp recordings and IV curves is the following. There's a convention. So if you're recording uh, using patch clamp recordings, if you see a current, and yet, you see a current that's going in the downward direction. This is by definition an inward current. Okay? If you see a current that's going in the upward direction, then it's by definition an outward current. Okay? So let me, let me take a second to talk about these currents. So in an electrical wire, you've had, many of you have had physics before, right? Or you're going to take physics. Electricity involves the movement of electrons down a wire. An electron is a negatively charged particle. Okay. So the way that the electricity flows is by uh, charge transfer, so that one electron flies to the next atom and so forth, so that the electron charge transfer can move down the wire very rapidly at something approximating the speed of light. Right? Electricity is very fast. Current in physiology is not the same. Okay. In physiology, Current is defined as the movement of a positive or negatively charged ion across a membrane. Okay. And so by definition, an inward current is the movement of a positively charged ion, such as sodium, from the outside to the inside of the cell. Okay. An outward current is the movement of a positively charged ion, such as potassium, from the inside the outside of the cell. Okay, so inward current, positive charge going into the cell, which is equivalent to the movement of a negative charge from the inside to the outside of the cell. Those are both inward currents. Outward current would be movement of positive charge from the inside to the outside of the cell, or movement of a negative charge from the outside to the inside of the cell. So those, that's what current means in physiology. So if we go back to the patch clamp recording, you have your system set up appropriately, and you're, you're, you're recording the uh, voltage difference between the inside and the outside of the, of the ion channel that you're recording from. If you see a current flow in the downward direction, this is by definition an inward current, which is by definition a movement of positive charge from the outside to the inside of the ion channel. And from the outside to the inside, of the two, um, the, two re the two regions that are uh, separated by the ion channel, okay? 
So this is an inward current. This is a patch plant recording the inward currents from the patch of the membrane from the nerve cell. This is an ion channel that allows positive charge to flow from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell through this ion channel that you've patched with your patch plant electrode. And so this ion channel sort of opens and closes spontaneously in this experiment. Okay? And you can see that the opening and closing is relatively random. And each time the ion channel opens, it's open for a specific amount of time and then it closes. Here it's open for a short time, here it's open for a longer time. Here it's open for a short time, a short time. So the channel opening time is variable and fluctuates around a mean open time. So if you, if you took these widths of the ion channel opening configuration and you average them, you get an average opening time of maybe one or two milliseconds for the standard deviation. So it's a, there's a little bit of randomness involved in these ion channel openings and closings. So if you could excite or inhibit the neuron, then what you'll see is an increase or decrease in the number of times that the ion channel opens and closes. Opens and closes. So it's the probability of the channel is open. But it doesn't change the mean opening. All right. So this is this is patch plant. We're recording either inward currents that go down, or outward currents, which are not shown here, but they would be going up. And that's how we could study the function of individual ion channels in the nerve cell. So probably Britt talked about this on Monday. Uh, what determines the magnitude of the current flow? So this is determined by uh, the, the permeability for the conductance of the ion channel. So the ion channel might be really big, so ions can flow through easily. It might be really small, so that only certain types of ions can flow through it, but they're hindered a little bit because the ion channel is small. So the size, the size matters in terms of how many ions can flow through the ion channel. Charges on the channel wall. If it's a negatively charged channel wall, then maybe positively charged ions can flow through better than negative, because positive. negative attracts positive, but it repels negative ions. And there are other factors as well. So this is one, this is one uh, factor that determines the amount of current flowing through an ion channel, and the property of the ion channel itself, its permeability, or its conductance. Then there are forces that act on the ions that force them to move. And one is the electrical driving force. Okay. So here's a, here's a situation in which there's a voltage difference between the anode and the cathode. Okay. And so this, this voltage difference creates a driving force on ions that are in solution. So for a positively charged ion such as sodium, the driving force is going to, it's, it's going to be repulsion by the anode and attraction by the cathode. So the ion's going to flow in this direction based on the electrical driving force, right? For an anion such as chloride, it's the op goes in the opposite direction. It's repelled by the negative cathode and attracted by the positive anode. Okay? So this is the electrical driving force. It's the charge difference. There's also a chemical driving force which, uh, which depends on the concentration gradient for that particular ion. So here, you have sodium chloride, seawater, very much like extracellular fluid, has a relatively high concentration of sodium and chloride. And on the other side, say this is a membrane, on the other side there may be a much lower concentration of sodium and chloride. So there's a concentration gradient such that uh, ions in a at a higher concentration, we want to move in the direction of uh, where there's a lower concentration of that ion. This is the chemical uh, driving force, or the force of diffusion. Okay? So there's electrical driving forces and chemical driving forces. So the movement of ion is, is determined by the concentration gradient. If it's in a high concentration, it wants to go to an area of lower concentration. And also the uh, electrical uh, 
the membrane attachment, which involves electrical attraction and repulsion. And an ion, if there's a concentration gradient for, the, for an ion, it will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Until enough of a electrical force builds up in the area of low concentration that repels that ion from continuing to travel to the region of low concentration. At some point, there is a equilibrium between the concentration gradient and the buildup of electrical force that prevents the ion from moving down to its concentration gradient. And those are the two forces that are at play for the movement of an ion in solution. Okay. And so the electrical forces are described by Ohm's law. The driving forces, the chemical uh, electric, the concentration gradient, the forces acting on the cells based on the concentration gradient are described by Fick's law of diffusion. So the electrical force is equal to the valence of the charge of the ion plus one, plus two for calcium, that could be negative, minus one for chloride, and also for voltage difference. So this, uh, this defines the electrical force acting on a given ion, charged particle, in solution. Voltage is basically the pressure that moves electrons through a circuit. The units are volts. Current is the number of electrons or ions that are moving through the unit time. And the unit is amperes, which is coulombs per second. A coulomb, did you talk about this on Monday? Okay. Is this number of charges, a Faraday is one mole of charges, which is this number of coulombs. You all heard this on Monday, right? Okay. okay. So here's an example. The inside and the outside are separated by the membrane that's only permeable to potassium. The potassium concentration is equal inside and outside the cell, so there's no chemical driving force. There's no concentration. If you set the memory potential to zero millivolts, which direction will current flow through the open potassium channel? 